call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Redefiners. I'm Huda Tahoon, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates, and I'm here once again with my incomparable podcast partner and co-host, Simon Kingston. Hello, Huda. Uh, great to be here for another gripping conversation in the series, and uh, very excited to be meeting our guest today. Very excited as well. So before we get started, just a quick reminder to our listeners that you can find all episodes of Redefiners and Leadership Lounge on YouTube. And if you're currently watching Redefiners on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button below so you don't miss an episode. Simon, we work with clients all over the world to help them build teams of transformational leaders. These are people who not only meet today's challenges, but also anticipate the digital, economic, sustainable, and political trends that are happening all over the world and reshaping the global business environment. We certainly do, Hoda. And as our listeners will all know, that world is not getting any less complex. The combination of geopolitical uncertainty, of climate change, of the possibility, but also the challenge of new technologies, and of course, the growing social demands on leaders in every sector make the world uh, a really interesting but challenging place for leaders. And that need for a new generation of global leader is something that our Redefiners co-host, Clark Murphy, discovered and indeed wrote about with our guest today uh, and his advice uh, when writing his book on sustainable leadership. It informs the way we think about a model of sustainable leadership, and I know it's something we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. But while that sustainability and the idea of it is easy to talk about, it can be very hard to deliver in reality. It's very true, Simon. And it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about our guest today. He's someone who has taken the challenge of sustainability to transform his company into a new renewable energy global powerhouse. That's not something that you hear about every day. No, and I'm, I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about how he did it and the lessons he can share with our listeners for his current and former sectors and for theirs. So Simon, please tell our listeners who our guest is today. Our guest is Francesco Storace. Uh, today, Francesco serves in multiple board positions. He's uh, the chair of the Governance Board of Sustainability for All. He's the chair of Science-Based Targets Initiatives uh, Board of Trustees. And in addition uh, to that, he's, uh, he's a partner uh, with, with a private equity firm EQT in the infrastructure space. But before that, and perhaps the thing I hope you'll forgive us for saying he's still most famous for is his <laughs> very successful tenure as chief executive of NL, uh, where he's credited with transforming the company into one of the world's largest renewable energy producers. And during that time, he began this engagement with organizations well beyond the commercial sector in two terms on the board of the UN Global Compact. Amazing. Francesco, welcome to Redefiners. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda. Thank you, Simon. It's a pleasure to be with you. We're very excited to have you on, and we're going to jump right in. You were CEO of NL, where you led the company's efforts to phase out fossil-fueled energy production and invest in renewable energy, as well as digital technology. And these are efforts that have helped transform the company into one of the largest renewable energy producers and the largest system of digitized electricity distribution grids. Please tell us about that experience. How did you transform a traditional energy producer into a renewable energy leader? Look, this is not me that transformed the company into something else. It's the company that transformed itself. And basically... The company was large and it became larger during this uh, nine years. Um, but the change happened because everybody, a, a, a large, let's say, a large majority of the employees and the people working in an health thought it was a good idea. So otherwise it would have been a frustrating exercise. I would say key to this was to go back and Ask people why do we? What is the purpose of our being? You know, why are we there? 
And, you know, most utilities were formed years and years ago with a very simple task that was bring lights to people and keep the lights on. That's super basic, okay? So we tried to get a little deeper in that and saying, what are the lights or why is energy needed? And we developed this very simple purpose that would be, we are around to empower progress of keeping this in a sustainable way. So we empower sustainable progress. That's key. Yes. With these very simple words opened up a lot of minds because eventually it didn't mean that we would have to change as a company. We would have to change the way in which we worked and we would have to change the technologies we would have to use to make it uh, sustainable and make it easy for people to, um, to use. Because we understood that the way in which we were providing this service was going to be questioned and was going to be difficult to swallow going forward more and more. And we had the, the willingness to be around for a long time. So how could we be around if we would not be accepted by, by people? And that was the key to that. So doing this, we understood that, you know, shifting from uh, a way of producing electricity that was uh, thermal generation to renewables was not a major ideological battle. It was just a way of doing our job better, cheaper, more sustainable, and, and, very, and, and very effectively. So that was a consequence, if you want, of, that, of this major thought about why we exist and why people should be happy that we are around. And Francesco, when you talk about purpose, purpose is... A, a critical part and has a major impact on culture and corporate culture. And then culture change is one of the vehicles, which is usually the hardest when it comes to making a transformation and the transformation that you were at the helm of leading. How did you get the team on board with the vision and the purpose to move into the direction to become a renewable energy leader? I was lucky in a way because the, the industry, I mean, not just, not just you know, the whole utility industry, has a deep-rooted spirit of service. So it, it's not difficult to find people that believe they provide essential service to society and they are proud about that. It was more an issue of eliminating layers of useless stuff that was painted on top of that. Like, we're here to make money, we're here to become big, we're here to be everywhere. We just went down back to, we are a service that is fundamental for society. And we want to do it in a way that society accepts it more and more. So it has to be sustainable. The people had it already in them. All we had to do was just remove the dirt, <laughs> let's say the, <laughs> the clutter that was in the room, and just leave that there. Everybody saw it and we said, yeah, that's, that's simple. Then how do we do it? Then that was a bit more complex. You know, how do we, how do we actually switch out of one thing into another? after decades of a certain habit, that was hard work. I mean, they, the um, motivation was there already. It was just a question of uh, remove the dust. And it would be great to unpack that a bit, Francesco, because I think many of our listeners will be thinking, gosh, he makes it sound incredibly easy. But you were doing an extraordinary thing. You were both building a company that ended up being a lot larger than it was when you were CEO, a lot more international, operating in 30 markets, and moving from a traditional producer of electricity into this host of uh, renewables, wind and solar, hydroelectric, geothermal. Mm -hmm. How did you go through that process of growth and change while keeping that very clearly articulated focus on the purpose, which comes across so so clearly when you describe it. You know, I came to Enel after another 20 years of work in the sector. So, you know, I, I reflected to what I had seen in the preceding 20 years too. And honestly, when you go back and think, you always also remember mistakes made and disasters. And, and what is common within the large mistakes that this industry has made in the past? Eh? And they all go back to one major flaw, that big things are somehow easier or in a way better than small things. 
And when I say big things, I mean big power plants, big, huge projects. They have a fascination. I mean, th- th- there is something in the minds of engineers that the bigger, the better. They love it. They love it. <laughs> it's, it's more complex. It's really a challenge. So it's, it's kind of magnetic in that. And I know I am an engineer myself. I'm a nuclear engineer, so I'm super exposed to this kind of thing, yeah. attraction. Okay. And, 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 and if you look back, you know, how many mistakes were made because of this huge mistakes? Lots of billions were written off because of this kind of approach. So basically we said, we need to adapt to a world that does not accept this anymore. Maybe. 50 years ago, it was possible to think about something like that, that extended over decades. Now it's not possible anymore. Our life is characterized by shorter cycles and you have, you cannot fight against this. You have to adapt to this. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. So we took a decision that was kind of epic. That was saying, we would never put our money, invest in anything that would take more than three years to be completed. And then that decision was key because it eliminated a lot of technologies that didn't fit in that. So we did not have a discussion about why this technology is good or bad. Does it fit in three years? Yes or no? It doesn't out. And that killed coal, that killed large uh, hydroelectric dams, it killed nuclear. It killed, I mean, it's a, it cleaned up the slate for us. We didn't have to argue. It just said, it doesn't fit in the timeline. And that's not our fault. But what can we do about it? And then people said, if we don't do that, how do we grow? Uh, can we grow only doing a few projects of windmills here and there? And they said, not a few. You have to do hundreds of them. So you have to do multiply the number of projects, being them small enough to fit in this three years cycle. So that changed drastically the life of management, the life of at the company because it's much more difficult. I mean, at the beginning, it seems impossible to manage hundreds of projects when you only have maybe 10 big ones. And, and that, that was a major change. That was a lot of work. That was amazing. You very sort of modestly describe it as kind of epic, but it is a curious paradox that it is. in order to grow, you need to focus on smaller projects and more of them. I mean, how did that play out with your leadership? What did that mean about the team you had to build and the way they worked to achieve that growth? And we didn't do it all of a sudden. We did it gradually. But at the beginning, people were scared, I, uh, honestly. I mean, they, there was a moment where they said, it's, it's impossible. I mean, this, can, this means that we have to multiply ourselves by 100. And yeah, I said, yes, maybe even a 1,000. <laughs> so you have to you have to change the way you work, the way you organize the processes you use. You have to digitize. That brings us why we digitize so early, because without that, this could have been impossible. So you have to totally revise and, and change the way in which you're used to work. But I assure you, it's going to be a lot funnier and, and you get a lot more satisfaction because during, say, three years, you might finish three projects, not just go... 30% of one. That was for me the most powerful change in, in, in the operations, you know, in the, in the day-to-day life of people. I always said, you know, it, it worsened the, light, the, the quality of life of management <laughs> by far. <laughs> a lot more stress. Uh, yeah, because you, you always have yeah. something going on that, that needs to be finished. You know, it's also it's, uh, but it accelerated the change in the minds of people in a big way. Big, big way. And, and by the way, it, because the, for the frequency of things, it accumulated learning in a, in a much more compressed way. So people started having experiences that were amazing in a very short time. And you, you mentioned a bit, uh, quite a bit, um, the digitization piece. Yeah. And a lot of the efforts that were done around that. And NL installed the world's first smart meters in 2001 and then moved into digitization of electricity grids, turning them into smart grids. Yes. How do you see technology continuing, um, particularly around the use of AI and generative AI in transforming, further transformation of the energy sector? Look, I, uh, we live, the utilities, and in particular, live among two worlds. We, we cover two worlds. Okay? One is the world of machines. 
machines mean the assets we manage, the plants, the lines, the, 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 the computers, the machines, okay? The other one is the world of our customers. So we, we live among these two worlds. We, we, we use the first world to serve the second world. That must be clear, not the other way around. Yeah. Okay. Because, <laughs> because there were moments where it was the other way around. Okay. Have you ever asked yourself, for example, when you change your home, you move from one apartment to another, even in the same city, served by the same supplier of energy, whatever, amongst the various things you need to do is you have to cancel one contract and then open another one. Have you asked yourself, why do you have to do that? It's a great question. It's always you, okay? And, and the other guy is always the same guy. So why do you have to do this stupid thing? Which, by the way, is just a cost for everybody, for you and for them. So it's, and there is a reason that you don't actually exist. You don't exist for them. You, the emitter exists for them. You are an appendix to the emitter. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. reason why. Yeah, no, it makes sense. So that is what I mean. That in that world, the one that time, customers were servants to the machines. They were not customers, they were end users, which is a different word. So we said the machines serve customers, not the other, the other way around. So you have to accept that you keep changing this damn machines so that the life of customers is made simpler and, and easier and less expensive, not the other way around. I should say that my predecessor was a genius, and Mr. Tato, was the guy that at the beginning of 2000 was so crazy to start putting digital meters in Italy when no one knew in the world why this would ever be useful. And he had an incredible vision, which proved right. I mean, Italy was fully digitized in between... 2000 and 2003, halfway through 2004, and it remained the only fully digitized digital uh, distribution system for another 15 years. Okay, when we started digitizing the Spanish grid after the acquisition of Endesa, so and the benefits of that, the experience we had, the incredible advantages, and the and the change in mindset that this uh, generated was what enabled us to quickly migrate to the cloud, quickly digitize a lot of stuff that helped us serve better the customers and not better that way out. I remember when we started migrating into the cloud in 2015 or 14, only one supplier was around. I cannot name it because, you know, and these, these people really were fascinated. They said, yeah, I mean, you're the first utilities ever coming to us. Do you want to migrate to the cloud? Everything. I mean, your data and your applications. I said, yes, everything. Nothing must be out of the cloud. Everything. Really? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Then after the first year, they, they came to us and said, you know, guys, this is, this is too much. I mean, your cloud is too big. Hmm. Mm. You, you, you are too big for us. And they said, you are the only ones. <laughs> it can't be. <laughs> you, you cannot walk away from us now. We are halfway. So you, tell us what you want, what, whatever. We will work like crazy. But there is no way back. I mean, the ship's been burned, can't come back. So you have to bring us to the cloud somehow, which they did. Well, to their, to their end credit, they did it in uh, another year and a half. So in about three years, we went into the cloud. We were the largest cloud that they ever managed. I think we're still one of the largest clouds around. But think about it. We have readings of our customers every 15 minutes, and we have millions tens of millions of customers, plus all the applications and everything. But doing that enabled us to accelerate the digital transformation in a big, in a big, big way, which made everything faster. I mean, it's a really interesting story, Francesco. And I'm resisting the urge to make a number of Rolling Stones uh, related references to clouds and not getting off them. But it sounds <laughs> as though you are, you know, you're an optimist when it comes to the application of, of new technologies. But right now, leaders are being bombarded with concerns and questions about, about generative AI, for example. I mean, and precisely the concern is sometimes that it will reverse that, uh, that, 
that priority that you described of of machine serving human. I mean, what's your feeling attitudinally? What's your feeling about whether this is a dehumanizing moment or a potentially empowering moment? First of all, I think that the percentage of people that talk about regenerative the generative AI that know what they're talking about is relatively small. <laughs> I mean, so there's a lot of people talking yes. about it, not really knowing exactly what they're talking about. And I'm sorry to say that, but it it appears like that. But it yeah. basically mm-hmm. happens every time a new technology appears. All of a sudden, people talk about it a lot. And, and then this fades away. So I think this debate will kind of settle gently with less hype and less noise uh, where it actually belongs. You know, it, it is an enabler of progress, yes. Like all enablers of progress, it can be used in a vicious way, yes. But how many times have we seen this in the past? It's nothing special about this one, too. It's just another one. And I'm sorry to be cynic about this. There will be people using it in a bad way, yes, like they did with social media. And technology is just technology. It's nothing wrong with it or bad with it or good with it. It's just the way we use it that makes it change. So honestly, I think it's like potentially a very powerful tool to do good things. <laughs> there would be always people do using it for the wrong ends. But uh, what can we do about that? Nothing really, yeah? Yeah, and that's really interesting because that takes us in a way into thinking about other things that are themselves morally neutral and it's a question of how we use them. And we touched earlier on on your involvement with a range of organizations that are in different ways, coalitions, um, the UN Global Compact. Um, we talked about SE for All. We talked about the Science-Based Targets Initiative. What is your view of how those alliances should work? I mean, how should the international system harness the skills and the resources of the private sector in partnership to make progress on sustainability? What's, the, what's your sort of theory of change there? I think there is an incredible mm, waste of goodwill and capacity. Um, that it's a pity. You know, and I think there is a incredible large number of people that want to make things better, that want to improve, make more sustainable progress in general, and make our life um, more secure, more sound, more more in tune with nature, and in general better, let's say, without um, most of the private sector being fully aware of this, okay? I think, by and large, the private sector should work more with these people and and should benefit from their willingness to help and, and and guide or enlighten, in a way, what what uh, what the private sector could do better. Um, and I think there is a misguided perception that it's a trade-off. And I hate this word deeply. I despise it because it's really stupid. It is not a trade-off. It is actually the opposite. It's an enhancement of value creation. Mm. Okay. So when people say, "Ah, but there is a trade-off between climate and money." No, no, it's not a trade-off. Francesco, you, you've told us a lot about the, the different parts of your career. Was there a redefining moment or two that helped shape your views, particularly around leadership or around sustainability? You know, but there is a moment where I, I was, this was so early in my career that I, I didn't even think of it when it happened to me, you know, when I, I, started working in the nuclear industry and I got bored because everything was so slow. Yeah, this three years thing, <laughs> I had it, I, had, I think. I did, but so I left it. I left it like eight months after I started. So I started working in construction, in the construction industry. Uh, and I, one day I was told, you go in this construction site in Saudi Arabia, there's 400 kilometers south of Jeddah, clear near the, the Yemeni border. And you will be the, the technical office manager because I had done, I was just a young engineer. I had done the design for this plan. It was a G plan. So I went there and when I arrived after 
you know, a long ride in the desert. The, the road was not even finished when we got there. There was the site manager, which was a, we came, became friend, obviously. He said, ah, good, you arrived. Fantastic. But you know, yesterday, the construction manager resigned. And so maybe you will be the construction manager. I said, Look, I've never seen even a welding machine in my life. <laughs> she, she must be nuts. He said, no, don't worry. <laughs> it's going to be fine. So this was an incredible discovery that I could do it. I actually, we did a pretty good job. We finished the plant and budget in time. So two years, less than three. I'm seeing a theme. <laughs> that was for me an, an, an incredible moment of discovery of what mankind can do if properly motivated. And, um, and of course, it was a big team effort. So, I mean, that was for me an incredible opening that I basically I could t- do many, many things. By the way, I reflected on this plant later. It was one of the most unsustainable, <laughs> completely unsustainable <laughs> projects you could think of. You know, this was burning crude oil. But it was in the 80s. It was in the 80s, so no one cared. It was gas turbine burning crude oil that was not, that was tracked from Jeddah to the plant with trucks, which unloaded. Then this stuff burnt. And by the time it was finished, we could not test it because there was not even demand for this power plant. It was just built because there was a plan to build a city with air conditioning so that certain nomadic tribes would be forced to stop moving around and put them, and, and put them into air conditioning homes. So it's like the... The 180 degree unsustainable project you can think of. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so proud that I did it. So, so that's another reflection. Yeah. You know, how many things you, you, you do that have different values over the years. Francesco, as you know, Climate Week is underway as we broadcast. And it's an extraordinarily important uh, moment where thousands of leaders from, from business, from government, and from civil society come together to talk about the world's progress on the sustainable development goals in general and on climate change in particular. You've been an important voice in many of these discussions in the past. What do you hope for this year and what do you expect? Look, I, I think this year, uh, because we're preparing also for COP, COP29 is, is right away, the issue that was left open was the point of how do the, say, there is this word global south, but let's say how do emerging economies participate in the decarbonization journey? Because without them, this is not going to be finished. And do they find the money to do that? Do they find the funds to, to really do this properly? And who can help them? And do you remember this was a discussion that was more or less well structured during the last COP, but not fully. So I think, I hope that the focus will be how to finally close the loop and, and say the funding, how does it get raised and how does it get channeled into the right projects for the global south so that we don't have, let's say, 10 years from now, how do we decarbonize the global south that in the meantime has gone the wrong way? So let's try to make it proper that the, there is the same mistake was made in the north is not done again in the south. I think that just, I think would be kind of a good a good progress already. Yeah. And and how confident are you that the era of double standards on that from countries in the global north towards low and middle income countries is over? I think it's in the hands of basically China and India. By and large, I mean, Europe is in that for sure, and the U.S. probably would follow. So I think it's really not, it's not impossible. I think it's quite possible, actually, much more than it was, say, three, four years ago. But the, as you say, there's a group of leaders now able to make that happen, perhaps more prominent was the, than was the case before. If you look back, there, were, there was denial until recently, and this denial is gone. It's already a major progress. Then you say, okay, we know there is a problem, but uh, who solves it at what cost? And if that is a cost or rather, like I say, an investment. So do we want to invest in our future? 
or do we see that only as a cause? It's a big difference, you know? So I think it's a question, do we want to invest in this? And I think if you put that question out there, how who can say no? Francesco, this has been absolutely fascinating as a conversation. And we like to end uh, each podcast with some rapid fire questions to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, this is where we ask you a series of questions and you respond as quickly as possible with the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Okay. First question. You speak four languages. English, Italian, Spanish, and French. Is there another language you would like to learn? I would like to learn Russian. Tell us why. Because I think we need to speak a lot between us and them. It's a great point. What is one piece of advice you would give to a leader going through a business transformation? Think about what the company looks like without you. I mean, think about what the company was before you. Before you, not with you, before you. And then understand it deeply. Because if you think about you and the company, you think about you only. Think about the company without you. And that's a lot easier. What do you wish you learned sooner? Um, well, I, I wish I would have understood sooner how this sustainability game was. I, I think I was late. I should have done it. In the 90s, not in the 2010, something like that. So that, that, I think, I would have avoided some mistakes. If you were to give a book to every member of your team, which would it be and why? There is a book that I read and read again. That is a fascinating book from a journalist. His name is Ed Conway. And it's about materials, the uh, Materials that shape the world. I think something like that. That's the title. I recommend everyone to read it. It's about six materials that are the basis of our civilization. It's an amazing read. I mean, it's, it's an incredible discovery. Which leader, which other leader do you admire most? I admire incredibly Kemal Ataturk. Mm. If you think what he did in a very short time, that's a change. Transformation. Yeah. Think about what, when it happened and in what time frame and what magnitude of change. Amazing. And overall, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the climate crisis? I'm optimistic about the climate crisis. I think there is a chance. Really, there is. And by the way, it's because technology works in an exponential fashion. So change that we think. If we look back and we say, inertially, we're, gonna, we're not going to make it. But if you look forward, the way in which things unfold, you can make it because it's exponentially driven. So it's, I'm optimistic. Francesco, thank you. That optimism is a theme as we look back on the conversation that's run through it from the beginning and that discovery of a mission that was to empower sustainable progress to the way in which you changed how people think about the nature of growth. I love the idea. Of, of thinking small in order to grow large. Um, the magic of the three-year window for change, the optimism about technology as you've used it and as the world can use it when harnessed, the optimism about the possibility of collaboration between sectors and between leaders north and south to deliver. And that, that optimism you, you gave us just now about humanity's capacity to address climate change, you, and we've referred to it, earlier, you, you very modestly said it was kind of epic. And it kind of is epic listening to you talk about what is possible. So thank you. Well, Simon and Hoda, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to, to chat with you. Thank you so much, Francesco. 